Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom, where experts share stories and secrets to unlocking financial independence. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focusing on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. I'm Ricky Trong, Camaplan team member and podcast host. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each guest. Welcome back to the road to financial freedom. Today, we're going to be talking to Fred Shatzoff. Since 1989, he has been in the lending business. Most of the time was spent in the mortgage business. Fred's an expert in FHA, VA, and first-time home financing. He's always been a top producer. And in the last five years, he spent working as a commercial loan broker. Please, let's introduce here Fred Shatzoff. Hi, how are you, Fred? Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. I'm looking forward to, you know, educating your audience and your clients and being of assistance and help to anyone who may want to, you know, get involved with investing in real estate and want to learn everything there is to know about financing. Wow. Great. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be speaking with you today. Um, So why don't we get started? And you tell me a little bit about your background, where you got started and where you're at today. And let's let's learn a little bit about Fred. Okay, great. Okay. So, you know, I, I was born in New York, but as a small child moved to New Jersey, I don't know anything about living in New York. Um, I actually even went to college in New Jersey. I went to William Patterson College, which has since become a university. I always had interest in finance and in numbers. And I went to school and I studied accounting. And I did that for a few years, but I didn't like it because you were confined to always being in the office, and I find myself being more of a people person. So I think it was like 1983 or 84, you know, I said, I don't know if I want to do this. So I saw a sign in a real estate office and I went in there and I talked to them and I decided, let me, let me go get my real estate license. So I went and I got my real estate license at that time. Um, when I first started the first house that I ever sold, it was $26,000. Okay. So, you know, it, I mean, as compared with today, now when I started interest rates were pretty high, they were like 18%. So the way we were selling houses was, you know, we were getting the sellers to hold a mortgage. Typically we wanted the borrower to have anywhere from 10 to 20% of the purchase price, the seller would hold a mortgage at a lower rate for 30 years with a five-year balloon. That that was how we sold houses back then, or houses were sold FHA or VA, where you could get in with three and a half percent or zero money down as a veteran. Okay. And you know, then I think it was like two, three years later, now houses were hundred and fifty thousand dollars and I remember that I had a house this house had been on the market for three four years and this was the highest priced house in this in Wayne Township I think it was listed for about three hundred and thirty five thousand dollars and another real estate agent came along with a buyer, a builder who wanted to buy this property. They were actually the house and there was four building lots and he was going to pay cash for the house. Now, 
The story of the house is very interesting because it was owned by three sisters who had inherited the house. One sister was married. The other two sisters never left the house. They reminded me of the Baldwin sisters from the Waltons. Some of your audience may be familiar with it. Some may not. They were always <laughs> dressed prim and proper, very polite, very nice people. Um, and I never worked so hard on a sale and it was an all cash deal because part of the problem was these people, you know, they wanted some time to be able to find a place to live. And there were other conditions. And, you know, we finally worked this deal out. And at that time, you know, I mean, I then made like a $5,000 commission as compared with making maybe $1,500 per house. And in those days, you used to have loan officers coming into the office. And, you know, I mean, I had a bunch of different people and a friend of mine who was in the lending business. And I decided, you know what? Let me go into the lending business because, you know, it had benefits with it. You weren't on a 1099. And, that, and that's kind of how I got started in the lending business. And, you know, I mean, times really, when I first started out, we were doing a lot of FHA and VA business. And, you know, I used to work in some of the urban areas and there, there would be family. There would be two or three families that would buy a house at the same time. They would buy a two to a four family, and we would literally have four or five borrowers on each one of these loans. We had a file package this thick because you had to verify employment, you had to verify bank accounts, you had to verify everything. And it was taking probably about 60 days to get these loans closed. You had to handwrite all these applications. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have email. We didn't have computers. We had pagers. You would be getting paged and paged and paged, and you'd have to go find, you know, a pay phone to make a phone call from. So, you know, as time went on, you know, we had laptops, we had cell phones, everything was done on the computer. And then, you know, somehow I ended up, you know, doing some loans for some real estate investors and started doing those loans. And what I say to, you know, an investor, I'll say to him, look, th th these loans are a piece of cake if you know what you are doing, because there are a lot of people out there and a lot of companies that don't know what they're doing. And he, here's, here's the reason why I say that. When, when you're buying a home to live in, everything is location, location, location. Whereas if you're buying a property to invest in, it's all about the numbers. You can't get emotionally involved in, you know, on investment property. An example, you know, suppose you look at a house that has tenants in there. It's a two or a three family. And you look at it and you say, oh God, I don't like this kitchen. I mean, the tile is pink. You know, these are old metal cabinets. You're laughing because that's probably the way your grandmother's house was. <laughs> so, you know what? If there's a tenant in there and a tenant's paying good rent and the numbers work, don't worry about that. I mean, look, you know, if a tenant moves out, you can always turn around. You can always fix up that house and modernize that kitchen, and then you'll get better rent. So it's really about the numbers. Do the numbers work? You know, like I'll give you a perfect example. Yeah, I spoke with someone today who's a real estate investor, and, you know, he said, well, you know, I'm kind of holding off right now because the rates are too high. So I said, you know, um, you know, remember, even though the rates may be high, it, it really comes down to again, do the numbers work? If you're getting positive cash flow and 
right now rates are about seven and a half to eight percent on an investment property. Does it really matter? At the end of the day, no. If you get a positive cash flow at seven and a half or eight percent, and you can refinance, you're going to refinance it at some point because. Like I said, when I first started, rates were 18%. How many times did people refinance? Recently, people got a 3% interest rate. So again, it really does come down to the numbers. Okay, that, that's number one. Number two, all, all of these loans are done either to an LLC or a corporation. So technically, you could form an LLC today and you could buy an investment property tomorrow because we're not verifying income. What we're really looking at is what is the rent versus the mortgage payment. They call it the debt service ratio. As long as the property debt service ratios, the property qualifies. Typically on an investment property, um, you're going to need about 20% down on a turnkey rental. Sometimes it might be 25 if the rents aren't so good. So that's number one. Number two, you know, typically they want you to have a 660 to a 680 credit score. It's relatively easy to have that credit score. All you really have to do is pay your bills on time. You know, make sure you don't have high balances on your credit card. You know, make sure there is no collection accounts. The next thing is, you know, you have to have the money. Okay. You have to have the money in order. I mean, I get people, oh, that $500. Well, what are you going to do with $500 to buy an investment property? So I try to let people down gently and say, you know, maybe you should look and maybe you should see if you can find a partner or the same thing if someone's credit is not so good. Maybe get a credit partner. Why is your credit the way that your credit is? So that's why I say these are really a piece of cake because you're not verifying very much. Yes, we're going to do an appraisal on the property. And that's for your protection too. You want to make sure you're not overpaying for the property, especially right now in today's environment. Yeah. You know, people were paying a lot above asking price, you know, you don't want to do that when it comes to an investment property because then maybe the numbers are probably not going to work. Now, that's one way to go. Another way is you could buy a property below market that needs repairs. When you fix it up, you know, the value increases. Sometimes people will buy a property like that and they, they want to turn around and they want to flip that property and make that property, make that profit. And that's a, that's a way for a real estate investor to get started who might not have a lot of money, you know, build up their cash by doing some flips, partner with someone maybe who's done that before. Now, that again is everything is number driven. What I mean by that is typically, let's say you're buying something at $150,000 and it needs $50,000 in repairs. Well, What's going to happen? So now you have $200,000 for the property. So if you've never done that before, you know, the lender's probably going to give you 160000 which means you need 40000 for a down payment. The property has to be worth, when you're done with the repairs, at least $229,000. So therefore, you could make a pretty nice profit on that. Some people buy a property like that, fix it up and turn it into a rental rather than sell it. But that's another way for someone to get started. J just like, look, if, if you've never invested before, the first thing you should really do is, you know, go out and buy your own home. That's the first step to financial freedom. Then the next step would be to go out and invest in a property. And if you have a home and you've owned the home for a long time and you have a lot of equity, you could always get a home equity line of credit and pull some equity out of the house and use that to buy another piece of property. They call it using other people's money. So, you know, but that that's typically what someone's going to do. Now, 
Another option might be, you know, maybe you have friends and family, maybe partner with them and put your money together with their money so that you can do something. There, there is always a way to do things. I mean, I, ideally, what you really want to try to do is keep your debt to a minimum. Now, it's hard. I mean, especially with everything costing so much more today and then people having student loans. But the first thing you really want to do is if you have student loans, try to get those student loans paid off as quickly as you can. You know, if need be, maybe you get a second job. You know, another option might be, and some people are not familiar with this, you become a wholesaler. And what we mean by that is you're going to find the property and you're going to put the co property under contract and you're going to assign, you're going to assign that property to another investor and you're going to make an assignment fee. You can make five to ten thousand dollars, you know, per wholesale deal. So you could build up some cash there because obviously, you know, if you're driving around in your neighborhood and you see a house that's run down. There are ways to do research and find out who the true owner of that house is and approach them. I mean, it's just like, you know, somebody gets divorced or somebody passes away. That's another way for you to really find some investment properties. Wow. That was so much information. Thank you so much, Fred. That's really enlightening. Um, I love what you say about... You know, I, I love how you show the differences from your time in the business, how everything was paper and now everything's electronic. And it's just showing how the world's been changing over the years. And you got to experience it firsthand, I feel like, in what you did. Do you feel like now it's a little with the uh, like technology aspect? Does it make, you know, this type of job and this type of um, investing easier for you to really get to know people and like f figure out who they are quicker than having to wait that full time frame to review all the paperwork like back in the I, day? I, absolutely. I mean, you know, like, like I'll give you a, a perfect example. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily drive all over the place to meet with an investor. You can meet with an investor on Zoom. Wow. You know, they could, they could email you, you their documentation. Uh, the other thing that I like about it is, and I always used to joke with people when I took a mortgage application, they would say to me, do you think we have everything? I said, <laughs> yeah. I says, however, I may end up calling you because honestly, sometimes I can't read my own handwriting. So I says, don't be surprised <laughs> if I call you to ask you, you know, what something says. I mean, you know, and, you know, I mean, you know, plus, you know, I mean, I, I can remember one time we were having a little trouble getting one loan approved. So I physically took the package and drove the package to the bank so that the underwriter could review that package. In addition to that, at that time, you know, and it's still today, if someone puts less than 20% down, typically you got to get private mortgage insurance. Yeah. So this borrow was putting 10% down. And I remember I drove from New Jersey to Philadelphia to bring the package to the private mortgage insurance company and waited there for them to, you know, approve the loan. Now, nobody would do that. I mean, certainly I don't think anybody would do that today. But, you know, my attitude is you do what you need to do because, you know, you couldn't be faxing a 50 to a 75 page package to someone. And, you know, time was of the essence. It's not like today where you could send something electronically to somebody. So that's definitely a big advantage in seeing the way that things have really changed. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, look, the biggest issue sometimes with technology is maybe the internet goes down or maybe you have to restart your computer. I mean, I still 
physically write a lot of notes on a lot of things, I guess just out of old habits and everything along those lines. But it's easy enough to go back and correct something if you make a typo as compared with, you know, if you're handwriting something, you can't have whiteouts, and now you got to redo part of the application. There were times I would have two or three applications on the person. Then when I left, I'd go home and I'd have to rewrite the whole application and put it all on one because, you know, you didn't want to start completely from the beginning. Otherwise, you would be there forever. I mean, yeah. and a lot of this, a lot of this stuff pre-populates as well. So, I mean, it is amazing to see how things have completely evolved. And it, it's and it's not that far back. I mean, you know, we're going back to, like, to the early 80s. It's yeah. not that long, you know. It's, it's not like it's ancient history, but it, no. it's amazing the way, you know, things have evolved and they have changed. Completely. But, you know, again, you know, it is about qualifying. It is about numbers. It is about location. You know, I see a lot of people investing out of state because sometimes they live in an area and properties are just so expensive that sometimes, you know, look, if you have a friend or a relative in a particular area, you know, then you could do that. I mean, the other thing you really want to do is you really want to have a good team of people to work with. You want to have a good lender, number one. You want to have a good contractor to work with, you know, because things are going to go wrong with these properties. You want to have a good real estate agent. You want to have a good attorney. You want to have a good accountant because all of these things are very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so just getting back to one thing here. So you started in real estate as a real estate agent, and then you went to lending. So Correct. now that you're in lending, can you give me a little bit more insight of the differences between FHA and VA loans? I'm not really quite sure of it. And I don't know if all of our listeners and audience really know the difference. How does someone, um, you know, how is someone eligible for those types of loans? Okay. All right. So first, first of all, anyone can get an FHA mortgage, but they're strictly owner-occupied loans. Now, I don't do those anymore, but I know people in the business. I refer people to them, but the advantage with FHA, you could buy a house with three and a half percent down as compared with needing five, 10 or 20 percent. Now, a VA loan is strictly for a veteran of the armed services, and that's one of their benefits where they can buy a house with no money down. So, oh, wow. because, you know, because typically, look, the biggest obstacle when someone is going to buy a house is having money for down payment and closing costs. That's why FHA and VA works very well. But I work right now strictly with a real estate investor. Okay. Now, the difference between me versus someone else is mm -hmm. I, I am what we call a broker. And what I mean by that is I represent a number of different lenders out there. And I vet the lenders before I even send business to the lenders, because there's a lot of companies out there that say they're going to do certain things. And, and I can tell when I speak to someone, whether a company is real or not. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had somebody approach me. Oh, yeah, we're a private lender. And we, we lend money to people on investment properties at 4% for 30 years. And I'm saying to myself, well, it, it doesn't make sense because, you know, if you buy an owner occupied property right now, rates are about five and a half to 6%. And typically on investment property, the rates are always a point, point and a half higher. So I'm saying red flag right away. Sounds too good to be true. So as they say, buyers beware because it's not always what you think that it is. And I can also tell if I speak to someone that works for the company who's the loan officer or the broker rep, you know, if they, if they don't know the answers to some basic questions, what are your fees? How long does it take to get a loan closed? Where are rates? 
Well, it depends. Well, it depends is not an answer. Can, can you give can you give me a range? I mean, I can't say to a borrower, well, the payment is it depends. The rate it is depends. They need to have somewhat of an idea. And obviously, you know, most people realize, okay, until we physically run your credit and the appraisal is done, you know, nothing is finalized because people will tell you, oh, I have a 750 credit score. Next thing you know, it's 720 or it's 700. You know, I mean, I don't expect them to know their exact credit score because it does change on a daily basis, but you can't be 50 to 100 points off. It's just like if you tell me you have $75,000 and now I look at your bank statement and you only have 10,000. Well, where, where is the other 65,000? Well, I can get it. Well, who are you, <laughs> you going to get it from? Where are you going to get it from? Are you going to go to the bank or are you going to rob the bank? You know, I mean, because if you're going to rob the bank, we're not going to do the loan because you're going to be in jail and you're going to foreclose on the loan. You know, so, you know, I mean, you know, I try to be as honest as I can with people. And, you know, if you need to explain something to me, explain something to me so we can figure out what we can do, you know, to get a particular problem resolved. I mean, you know, don't, you know, oh, don't worry, I can get the money. Well, you know, you can't put that down on an application. Assets, don't worry, we can get the money. And the writer's <laughs> going to laugh at you. I mean, it, it just, it doesn't work that way. If you don't have the money, okay, fine. You know, if you're pl- expect to get an inheritance and someone passed away, you're just waiting for the money. Okay, fine. Then maybe you should wait before you do anything. I mean, but, you know, I try to be honest and I try to let people down gentle and educate them and say, here are some things that you can do so you can get financing and be able to buy a property. Yeah, well, I think the education of it is really the key importance because if if you don't know, you know, the rules, how are you supposed to know unless you're educated on it? So, I think, you know, especially with you having so much experience with different factors of not only being a realtor and in the lending and a broker, you know, connecting all those types of businesses together, it really, you know, gives you a higher up. It gives you that experience level that you can educate people. So, I love that. Um, I think it's really interesting. Now, um, so we had talked about you being a broker and do you do a lot of education with your clients or is it mostly like, you know, making sure they can secure that loan, making sure the, you know, everything can go through. Tell me a little bit about your processes with your clients. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, you know, I, I do do a lot of education with people. I mean, because you know, you, you get, I get calls from people I've never invested before. What do I do? How does the process work? So I'll walk them through, you know, this is what you're going to need to do, you know, and this is what you're going to need to have. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the first questions I'll ask them is, you know, do you have an LLC set up? Okay. If they say no, you know, are you willing to set one up? Because that's the way that these loans work. And most people are willing to do that because you can typically do that online yourself. Then I'll say, do you have a particular area where you're looking to invest? Have you looked at any properties at all? What what are properties going for? You know, I mean, are you looking for something that is, you know, rent ready? Are you handy? Do you have connections with contractors? What is it that you want to do? What what are your goals as far as what you want to do? So I try to get to know them, you know, ask them about their credit. You know, I mean, obviously, if somebody tells me, gee, I've got a 580 credit score, I'll say, well, what, what is it that's causing your credit score to be 580? And, you know, people say I have a lot of debt or I'm behind on. I mean, I had one particular woman, I think she had said, oh, I think I found the property. This is okay. 
great. You know, she's telling me, well, I think the seller will hold a mortgage on the property. So I think the property was about 70000 So we start to talk. And, you know, I said, well, where do you think your credit is? I think she said it was around five something. What's causing it to be so low? Well, you know, I have a lot of debt. I'm also behind on my, I think she said her car loan and things along those lines. Mm. And I, I said, well, you know, about how much money do you have that you're working with? About a thousand dollars. I said, look, if the seller is going to hold a mortgage, you're probably going to need 10 to 20% down. Honestly, what you should really do is probably try and get your debts caught up. And maybe you should start out doing some wholesaling and build up some cash and get your credit all caught up because a thousand dollars is not really going to be able, you're not really going to be able to do anything with a thousand dollars you know and I, I don't think she got it because i went through some numbers and then she emails me I, well i think we can get the seller down to thirty thousand dollars do you think you can help me i said look you know I, again you know you only have a thousand dollars to work with your your Everything is behind on your credit. Nobody's going to loan you additional money if you can't even pay the bills that you have right now. I said, you know, you're really better off waiting a little bit on this. Plus, this property was going to need some work. I, I said, it, it's probably a little bit over your head at this point. You know, and then she, you know, she thanked me and said, no, I appreciate it. I said, well, you know, what, why, why am I going to? you know, tell you, oh, yeah, you can qualify. And why am I going to take your, you know, application and order an appraisal? And then you're not going to get approved. Then you're going to be upset. I mean, that that's not how I make any money. And, and I don't believe in being dishonest with somebody. Look, if you don't qualify, let's try to see if we can come up with a, some suggestions as to what to do and see if maybe you know, a year down the road or two years down the road, at least it's going to give you some goals and it's going to give you some direction as to what to do. I mean, I try to take a consultative approach with people. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, yeah. Cause I mean, you don't want it to, I don't want to say waste time, but you don't want to have that upsetting factor of, you know, if she does get turned down and I totally understand that that's, I mean, that's relatable to, I think we were talking before we started recording today. And I had mentioned that my husband and I, we have a rental property. It used to be our home and it was a rental property, but we were so far into the mortgage process at one point when we were purchasing. And then I unfortunately had an issue with my job and I, um, you know, I went on short term disability for a long time and there wasn't really, um, you know, paperwork that could support that we would be able to afford it moving forward. So the one company wasn't able to process our mortgage and we were like just at the end of it too. And that's what came back from the underwriter. And, you know, it was really hard to deal with that, but luckily we were able to find a you know, a different means of get of getting the rest of the money for to show for that mortgage, and we were able to get it. So it does take. A, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it it took some time, but you know, we waited and we were able to you know get that paperwork together and show the funds in both of our accounts, and it was just you know, it was really perfect. It was right before the pandemic, so we closed on our house. Like I think two days or three days before all of Pennsylvania shut down. And it was a nightmare after that, trying to furnish the house, but we had a house. So <laughs> you had a house. I mean, yeah. So, you, so you, you did it. I mean, you know, yeah. and you pursued it and you found someone that, you know, was going to be able to help you. I mean, unfortunately something happened beyond your, your control, but right. You know, but, you know, that's why you got to have a conversation with the lender that you're doing business with so they could say, well, what if we do this? Yeah. You know, maybe we put somebody on as far as a cosigner. Maybe we come up with a little bit more money as far as a down payment is. Exactly. Things along those lines. Yeah. But knowing but, those options up front was really important. And that's what I was, you know, that's my my hand, my clap for you, because it's really great that you do that for the people that you want to work with. It's not like you're just pushing them aside saying, Hey, you know, sorry, not going to work by like you give them that 
information, you're giving them that opportunity to be able to still do this investment or own that property. So I really, I, I think that's great. I mean, there's some people that don't really have patience like that. And to be able to offer that is something great for both of you to build that connection together. And, you know, it could be a lifelong client. So that's amazing. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you want to do that. I mean, you want to try to have a conversation with somebody so that they know what their options are. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, so being in the businesses that you've been in over the years, if you were to talk to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself that you've learned, you know, after all these years of being in the business? What would you say? And I mean, I, I would probably say, you know, what I probably would have done was, you know, what when I bought my first property, it was a condo. And, you know, I stayed there for, I don't know, seven, eight years and then got married. And then we sold that condo. We bought a bigger townhouse. I, I wish I had just said, you know what, let me let me keep this condo. Let me rent this condo out so that I would have had, you know, another piece of property, especially you look at the way that values have gone up so yeah. you know that that's one thing that i do wish that i had you know done is held on to that condo and you know now you would have had some additional income plus you would have had all that equity and all that appreciation there because you know that that's really the way that you really try to really build true wealth is by having other people paying your bills yeah. for you. Now, the one thing I would say to, and I always say this to a lot to investors that are saying, well, I want to buy rentals. Okay. You know, are you looking to buy a single family or a multifamily? Sometimes people will say, I want to buy a single family. Well, I say to them, why don't you consider buying a multifamily? Because if you have a single family and your tenant moves because tenants are going to move. They're not going to stay forever. Now you're going to have no income coming in on that property and you still have to pay the mortgage as compared with if you have a two, three or four family. Yeah. Now you're going to have that income coming in from the other apartments. It's not going to be full income, but it's probably going to be enough to cover the mortgage until you get that new tenant in there. I mean, yeah. but some people want to invest strictly in one families and that that's fine as well just realize that if a tenant leaves you're gonna have no rental income coming in and just be prepared you have to carry that whole mortgage that whole entire time yeah but until you fill it right right until you fill it exactly i mean you can't turn around and say to the bank well gee i don't have a tenant in there <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, typically a down payment is a little bit more on an investment property as compared with owner occupied. But if you think about it, you lose your job. Okay. You're going to obviously try to pay your mortgage on your house first because you need a place to live. If you have an investment property and if you have to lose the investment property, you know, I mean, you're still going to have a place to live. I mean, but, yeah. you know, but, but that, that's how you have to think and you have to look at it as far as a business. And that's why you want to have an LLC, keep things separate from, you know, what you own in your personal name and everything along those lines. Um, but, you know, I mean, I would say that, you know, that was probably, you know, one thing I wish I had done, but you know what? You live and you learn with a yeah. lot of different things. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that knowledge, you know, especially for the younger investor that may be listening. I mean, they now have that knowledge is like, it's like what my husband and I did, you know, the house was no longer an option for us to live in. It was too far from our parents. His dad had gotten sick and we were just like, are we going to sell it? What are we going to do? So we ended up renting it out. Now, yeah, it is a one family, you know, small townhouse, but 
I mean, that just kind of perked our enthusiasm about wanting to have rental properties. And right. know, that's that's now what we're going to, we want, you know, we want that, um, you know, passive revenue coming through. And yeah, I mean, that's a great, thank you for like telling us the differences sure. between owning the single family and then a multifamily unit. Cause I never really thought about the benefits of, you know, yeah, one person might leave the rental, but you still have the three other rentals coming in to, you know, still pay for the, it may not pay for all of it, like you said, but it would definitely take a huge chunk of what otherwise would be owned like on the single family. So that's a really no. great piece of information. But but, it, but in your particular situation, it was a little bit different because you already right. own the property mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, it's just, you know, like I know some people, what they do is, you know, when they decide it's time to buy a house, a lot, some people will start out, they'll buy a two family as their first house. So that now they have the rent helping them make the mortgage payment. Yeah. And then some of those people turn around and then they will, you know, be able to save money and then buy another house to live in it and hold on to the two family. And now they have the rent from apartment one and apartment two. So that that's another way for someone to start out. You know, I mean... You know, at least you have someone helping you pay the mortgage and, you know, gives you an opportunity to save a little bit more money and then you could buy another property. I mean, in that particular situation, you could take advantage of an FHA mortgage with three and a half percent down and buy a property like that, you know, because, you know, the hardest part sometimes is getting started and saving that money for a down payment. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's great option to know that you can get that type of loan, you know, and use it that way. I definitely going to have to let my husband know about that so we can start looking into that. I love that. Um, well, Fred, I feel like I can listen to you for hours. You just have such great stories and great information that you're passing to us. Um, so just one question here. Um, that we're trying to ask everyone this season is what are your views on financial freedom, whether you've reached it or not at this point, what, what makes you feel like you've reached financial freedom or what is that, that goal to reach financial freedom for you? I mean, I look, I, I would say the goal for financial freedom for someone is to have enough rental or enough residual income coming in that you know, it covers all of your bills and gives you a profit so that if you don't feel like getting up to work that particular day, you have enough, you know, you have enough income coming in, you know, to cover your bills and have, you know, money to be able to live and not be living for your job. Um, yeah. Have I reached it? Um, no. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm getting close to reaching it, but you know, no, I've not reached it. I mean, obviously we all make mistakes, but, you know, the thing really to do is, you know, either have some kind of residual income or rental income, obviously, you know, as they say, use other people's money. So as you build up equity in a house, you know, you can always take the money out of the house and use it to buy another piece of property. Or something along those lines. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just like people that are in the insurance business. I mean, you know, they have tremendous residual income because, you know, if someone's in the, um, if they provide auto or homeowners insurance, people are going to pay that. You know, you're not making a big amount of money every month, but if you have enough clients, it adds up. And again, you know, Financial freedom is being able to have enough income coming in to be able to cover all your bills and have money left over. Real estate is definitely a way to do it. That's for sure. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's it's definitely not spending your money. It's, you know, using people's other people's monies, as you said, um, yeah, to substantiate yourself. And I think that's you know, I, that's the goal for everyone's financial freedom, I think, in a Correct. nutshell. I agree. But, yeah, I love that. 
Well, just before we get finished here today, Fred, um, where can everyone find you? What's the name of your business? Tell us a little bit about that so that we can make sure that people can find you if they want to learn more, or, you know, use you as a broker because sure. you, know, you really the, know what you're talking the, about. <laughs> the, the name of my company is Everest Business Capital. So someone could call me 551-272-9067. They could email me, fred at everestbusinesscapital.com. Or they could go to our website at everestbusinesscapital.com. You know, there there is a contact me page. Um, you know, certainly feel free to call me. You know, if you need to talk to me after hours, I'm available as well because I know some people work and it's a little difficult, you know, but you know, certainly, I mean, I'm happy to talk to anybody. You know, don't ever feel that you're asking you know, a dumb question, because believe me, you're not the only person that has that question. So, you know, certainly I would love to be able to be of service and help to, you know, anyone listening to this podcast. And, you know, I want to thank you for having me on as a guest. Oh, well, thank you so much, Fred. We really appreciate you being here today. And I don't know about everyone else. I'm hoping they feel the same way, but I learned a lot and I'm definitely going to be doing some more research. I'll probably give you a call to find out, you know, some of my questions that need answering because you have so much experience and I feel like the knowledge is just very plentiful with you. Um, so just as we're ending here today, I just want to make sure we thank our sponsor, Cama Plan, our producers, Honeycomb Productions, and of course, Fred Shadzoff. Uh, his links will all be in the description, but you can definitely find him at everestbusinesscapital.com. He's on social. You can call him. You can contact him through his website. Email him, fred at everestbusinesscapital.com. And for more information on self-directed IRAs, please visit camaplan.com. You can request a contact consult with an expert. You can view our media library. It has our old podcasts as well as our webinars, future and past. And you can also open an account today. So if you're listening, remember, like, follow, share our podcast, The Road to Financial Freedom, and continuing with us on this journey to path of finding success. Thank you so much, Fred. I hope everyone has a great day.